you're joining us, right? Are you on the panel as well? Where would you like to sit? Which depends on how squashed you want to be on that sofa. I can, I can sit. Like well, I can sit here. Yeah. <laughs> it's nice. And then. Do you want to be snuggly, <laughs> you want to be snuggly on the sofa or not? I think, I think how many of us? One, two, three, four. Of Oh, that fucking light's like, killing my eyes. So you, 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 feel, you feel free to sit here. Lena, come sit next to me. Ed, sit next to one in, and then Lena can sit here. And then that's not too cosy on there. So you can spread out a bit, Ed. Yeah, that's it. We've got three on there, one here, and then. Yes. Yeah, man, get in. Snuggle on the sofa. That's a game between Ed and Lena. Ed, shuffle up. You love it. Hello, hello. Okay, are we all met? Ah, welcome. Uh, today's been such an exciting day. You look. Is the, the flux capacitor good? <laughs> I think that's what that is. Um, hello, my name's Catherine, Catherine Temple Lewis. Uh, I feel so inspired by today. This is so exciting. You guys are so snuggly on the sofa. <laughs> um, I'm a creative scientist. What I actually do is I curate cross discipline teams around problems to share perspectives and to try and sort of tackle new world challenges. I've been described as recklessly optimistic, but I would like to challenge that and say that I think I'm radically hopeful. Um, and days like today really make me believe that uh, in, in a really big way, because today has been very hopeful and we don't have enough hope. The title of this panel is Dystopia to Protopia, and it's really about realistic hope. Um, in light of the citizens' form being uh, dissolved because we're running a bit late, we're actually going to reduce the panel time and make it more of an open forum so that you guys can have a discussion with these amazing people and a bit more of a say. Because I am very enamored with the quote, which is given to lots of different people, which goes, you see things and say why, and I dream of things that have never been and say why not. Some people say Kennedy wrote it, some people say George Bernard Shaw, who I think wrote it. Um, and I've always really believed that a measurement of success is inspiration. You know, the more you can inspire people, the further you can create change. And this, today has been this very inspiring day, but where do you go from here? How do you amplify these voices? How do you amplify this inspiration to actually change realities? I believe in morphism. I believe that language does shape reality. And whether or not you believe that, language is definitely a technology. It's definitely a tool with which we construct narratives. And those narratives then shape expectations, perceptions, um, and then shape realities and what people do. If you look around today, if you actually Google future cities, you get these two different images that come up. You get these very sort of... I'm going to move a bit back further so that I can see you. So I'm not looking behind me. Watch out, oh, watch out. I'm on the end. <gasps> no, OK, hang on, hang on. Okay, whew, that's the reason. <laughs> I was nearly awful. Um, or really exciting. Uh, if you Google future cities, what you get is you get these two different images. You get these very utopian, very sterile, very empty, with sort of, you know, like someone talked about today, sort of nature closed in. Or you get these sort of dark, dystopian images come up. And actually, this idea of protopia, who here has heard of protopia before? Oh, one person, that's exciting. Mm. I love spreading new words. Um, it, was, it was developed, um, originated with Kevin Kelly, who was spoken about today. He talked about future blindness, this idea that being presented with these two different types of narratives, this sort of disappointing and sort of utopia that actually wasn't very desirable, and this terrifying dystopia, that we have developed a future blindness, an inability to see plausible and realistic, and most importantly, collective futures. We need to change these narratives because these narratives are dystopian that are out there. You know, we need to shift our language. There's a lot of talk about singularity. There's less talk about plurality. There's a lot of talk about the individual. There's less talk about collective futures. We need to change from tech-driven experience to experience-driven technology. 
but how do we get there? So this is what I'm gonna ask you guys. <laughs> we have an amazing panel here to discuss how we start to take today's theme, that division, which language itself has divided. There's been this big, you know, everyone's acknowledged that since Descartes we've been you know, a split mind and body, but there's less acknowledgement of this division between human and nature, and it runs right through our modern language. So I'll get each person to quickly introduce themselves, because mm -hmm. that'd be better than me making some stuff up. <laughs> so on my left. Hello, I'm Carl H. Smith. Um, I'm an academic and I run a research centre looking at how people use technology to learn. Um, and it really is a tough, tough area to work in because so much of technology does exactly the opposite, um, makes us very stupid. So I'm really interested in how do we redesign technology to um, yeah, create new operating systems? Um, how, do we inf how do we use the non-dual operating system, for instance, to stop harming and, and stop thinking that there's a, there's an, a way that we can throw things into? So I'm really interested in how technologies, including entheogens, can give us this new experience that will transform our, our behavior going forward. Um, and yeah, I'm just, I suppose I'm very much interested in in all the different ways we can augment consciousness and transform consciousness and move into these new forms of consciousness. So ranging from the psychedelics to the technologies and then to the, to the inner technologies, to all of the human things that we innately have, but we've forgotten we have them. So how do we access all that again? Thank you. Lena. Hi, everyone. My name is Lena Korkovalu. I come from Greece originally. I'm a writer and freelance journalist, and uh, I have a background in theory of culture and literature, creative writing, and international journalism. So obviously, what I'm most interested in is narrative and uh, words and how uh, we shape the world we live in through the myths that we create and propagate. Uh, I champion the humanities whenever I can, which I find is a field that is massively neglected in this techno-scientific um, world that we live in today. So I'm going to talk a bit about uh, these issues. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Sam Gandhi. Um, I, have, so I have an academic background in uh, ecology, entomology, so that's kind of stemming from a long-term love of nature, uh, wildlife, and kind of more recently, I've been working for, the, as mentioned before, the Beckley Foundation, which is a think tank charitable trust geared towards instigating funding research into uh, the medical therapeutic potential of psychedelics and cannabinoids. Um, and my sort of uh, particular interest is the dissection, the intersection of, I guess, ecology and psychedelics, uh, not just psychedelics, but the capacity of them to uh, increase human nature connection and the implications that stem from that. But other things as well, psychedelics are just part of that. But uh, yeah, both things are all about interconnection and reconnection. Uh, and that's sort of like something I, th I think is really important and really interesting. Hi everyone, um, I'm Ed Thurdo, and I've been working on a project for the last couple of years uh, uh, to build templates for a dis distributed seed library. So rather than having one big seed library, we're kind of dreaming of a, a lot of little uh, seed libraries, or what we refer to as seed pods, kind of mimicking the mycelium growth around the world that are then connected um, with technology. And the hope with that is by uh, reassociating our supply chains, we can reconnect with our origins. I think David mentioned earlier about, you know, we are very much what we eat and what we consume, but we are so disassociated from the origins of that. And it's been my experience in um, kind of communing with uh, some of the indigenous people who have never necessarily lost that connection. They never really separated themselves from nature in how, our very consumption can actually be an act of creation. And often we're in cities in this disassociated supply chain, we're always choosing the, you know, the choice of least harm if, if we're conscious about what we're doing or if we're aware. Whereas could that be, oh, we're choosing uh, a choice of most creation or um, pr pr protecting diversity in the way we consume? Um, and I guess that's the kind of that's the kind of crux for me. Is like how can these profound, you know, psychedelic experiences be achieved um, in day-to-day -day 
consumption and following the origins of what we consume, um, which obviously is a never-ending trail. You know, there is no um, there is no origin of the origin. It's always you know the oak, the the acorn always came from an oak tree, which then came from you know another acorn, and so on and so on. Um, and it's I kind of would kind of sum it up in this in this um, experience that I've had along this journey, which is when you kind of come home, you come home to the unity that we are all one being. There is only one self that wakes up. But, you know, there are actually very few people on this planet who, who have that feeling of the seven billion. And, yeah, you know, there's all this kind of um, dystopia that's projected around how, you know, bad the world is, you know, we've got this, you know, these extinctions that are happening. But if only a few of us are connected and you can feel that much, you know, love and unity in a room like this when everyone's really resonating around different topics but with a very, you know, uh, a very um, centered uh, philosophy, why, well, you know, what's going to happen? What's the, um, the potential for when a lot more of us wake up? And, you know, we've had... I guess, beings throughout our history, you know, someone was talking earlier about Christianity or, you know, um, the Buddha who really embodied this connection and unity with everything that they have. She's gone silent. Um, sorry, okay, I'm speaking too long. No, I was going to say, um, hold that thought because we're coming back to that exact yeah. point. So I'm going to get Dave to quickly introduce himself and then... <laughs> yeah. That's what it's about. That's how good I am, do it in my mind. <laughs> someone gone as well. Hello. That was working a minute ago. Hello. Ah, uh, hello. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, I'm David Luke. I'm a psychologist. It feels a bit like an AA confession, but it's, it's not. It should be. Uh, so I work at the University of Greenwich, and uh, I do a lot of research on psychedelics. And I do some research when I'm not on psychedelics, but it's not as much fun. And uh, one of the things to do is host and organize the Breaking Convention, which is coming up in a couple of weeks, which is going to big event of just kind of bringing a lot of people together in the community of psychedelic research and culture. Um, and I guess my main kind of project, overarching project, is to just shove as much magic in through the back door of the academy uh, because, you know, I think academia has been kind of disenchanted for a very long time and that's kind of what we need to do. So I do some stuff like Sam and looking at psychedelics and, and nature connectivity uh, but also looking at kind of more transpersonal and parapsychological phenomena, uh, uh, you know, more kind of broadly about kind of connectivity between ourselves and other species and other people and maybe even other beings. Uh, so that's kind of what I do. And um, yeah, thanks for being here. Brilliant, thank you. So everyone here, well, in fact, everybody here creates narratives because that's what we do as humans. We create narratives um, to communicate ideas and futures. What I would like, we have only sort of 40 minutes, and I'd like all your voices as well, is to actually have a look at what these narratives we need to be telling are. So, um, Protopia was described as incremental change. It's not going to be perfect, uh, there's going to be challenges, but it's collective change that we can actually get a handle on. So you all come from different backgrounds, from the arts, from science, from technology. So first I'm going to quickly throw to you guys. What Protopia means to you and how your work, so for your example, technology, mm. can actually help us create these nar collective narratives. Mm. So I'm going to start with, actually, should we start this end and yeah. go backwards? Can we start with you? Uh, so uh, I guess my work is, is kind of classic technologies of consciousness, really. I mean, Carl deals with the kind of interface with kind of uh, more yeah, gadget, gadgetized technology. Mine's more just purely the technology of consciousness, be it through kind of psychedelics or meditation or shamanism or hypnosis, dreams, lucid dreaming, whatever it may be, just like loosely described as altered states. And I think they are, you know, the perfect way of kind of access into uh, just creating the kind of future that we want to see, a, a protopia. Um, through a kind of collective dreaming, through a kind of deeper connection and connectivity. Uh, you know, you could apply what we're discovering with psychedelics perhaps to all altered states in that they increase connectivity from every level, uh, from, you know, the biological, the psychological, the sociological, the ecological, and even through to the kind of 
cosmic or cosmological, let's go call it cosmological. You know, so on a biological level, we have increased interconnectivity between different parts of your brain, which leads to kind of greater uh, creative insights and uh, uh, a deepening of connection with oneself as well on a psychological level, uh, on, a, on a sociological level, psychedelics and, and other altered states in, enhance kind of uh, pro-social behavior, empathy, uh, deeper connectivity, uh, compassion, etc. Not just, but also. And uh, on, a, on a kind of ecological level, as Sam probably can tell us a lot about, they increase our connection with nature. People become more connected with nature, more concerned about nature, change their attitudes and their behaviors. Um, and then, of course, on, on a cosmological level, people have you know, very cosmic experiences of being connected with uh, a kind of a higher purpose or thing or even the cosmos itself. So you can see that the sweep of, of you know, the effects of psychedelics or any altered state has these, uh, the power to kind of increase connectivity across every scale in a kind of crude way of looking at it. I was going to say, Sam, this is something you talked about earlier. This, you know, it lasts, even if you have these very clinical trials, you still find this connection with nature, you know, even though it's a very unnatural situation. But do you find there's then a problem, people taking those new narratives and new ideas out into sort of a public world? You know, is it, we, is it we still not living in a world who has values that can accept those new narratives? Um... So what are you saying? Uh, what are the sort of challenges then for, for all the work you do to actually amplify that and to get people to, to listen and pay attention and, and you know, use what you've learned? Um, well, yeah, I guess just, just personally, just like just talking about it to, to people and talking about this, this stuff, it, people seem to be kind of like interested and receptive. Has uh, there been a change sort of over time? Do you think this is gathering momentum? Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, just, yeah, more broadly, not just in this specific context, but like, um, yeah, as I was sort of saying before, like there's been a few things recently, like publication of uh, Michael Pollan's book, How to Change Your Mind, that's definitely kind of expanded the psychedelic sphere of influence mm -hmm. uh, in quite a big way. The decriminalization movements like starting up in the in cities in the States, although they're very local, um, they are symptomatic of big cultural shifts now with, with psychedelics and, and people sort of, um, yeah, their right to access them for their own self-betterment. Um, so, yeah, things are definitely shifting. The conversation is expanding into sort of more mainstream circles. Um, so, And how yeah. could sort of everybody here wanted to do one thing to help push that conversation on? What could you do? Um, I would say, uh, are, we, so are we talking specifically about sort of psychedelic nature connection yeah, stuff? Yeah, so like anything that sort of reconnects human and nature and, and builds a more positive future narrative. I think just um, tell tell people about it. Like speak to friends and family and loved ones and people. Like if it if it benefits you, if it gives you peace and and joy, um, like share that knowledge with other people, you know, like speak about it, maybe even write, you know, write about yeah. it, get it, get it out there, spread, spread yeah. the word. I mean, there's something Ed, that we talked about, we, we've lost storytelling in a way, you know, our story, our, our main storytellers, terrifyingly at the moment, we were the ones with the biggest reach, are sort of things like the media, oh, I'm going to say the word influencers and vomit a bit in my mouth, but... <laughs> You know, what happened to sort of grandparents telling, you know, people in the village stuff? So we talked about that, didn't yeah, we? Yeah, exactly. And um, Bertrand Russell had this great quote, and he said, there's opportunity in distraction. And we're clearly very distracted. Like, when we walk around outside, you know, we have our mind gets pulled, our eyes get pulled by all these different distractions, whether it's advertising. And I feel we've really got to embrace those distractions and look at the mediums that the distractions are in. So, I mean, I was at a a talk not that long ago about AI and um, augmented reality. And they said there are two billion gamers that play a game every day on their phone. So there are kind of three main areas where I feel there's uh, the seeds of uh, positive distraction need to be planted. And one of those is on screens, like the content uh, needs to be more, engage us into the natural world, which is where I really, you know, vibed with what Carl's doing with context craft and how we can use uh, AR to bring us back into the stories, you know, the myths around the plants that have been forgotten or, you know, around the rocks or um, the planets, all these, you know, wonderful Greek myths that people were talking about earlier. Still, there's, there's a lot of unmined value in, in those. And 
they say something different to you every time you hear them. And then the other kind of areas where I feel there's a massive amount of distraction is um, money. So we've got to attribute some kind of economic value in the capitalist system to these processes, to, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really into broadening our supply chain, the diversity of food in our supply chain, but also the diversity of stories around that supply chain. So yeah. I kind of, I always have a few Swiss friends and I'm kind of always laugh with them about, you know, Swiss chocolate. Never seen any cacao growing in Switzerland. I've been there a few times, yeah. but it's like, well, how, how does that disempower the consumption of the chocolate, disassociating it from where it, where it came from? We've lost those or, or origin, the origin stories. stories around it. Yeah. Um, and celebration stories. There's something, Lena, we talked about. Like, there's, I don't even want to say this, actually. We don't, we, we deconstruct sadness a lot, which is important, but we don't deconstruct celebration or happiness as much as perhaps we should. You know, we've, we've lost ritual, we've lost spirituality. I know a lot of your writing sort of focuses on, on that side yeah, of things. Right, uh, the way I see it, our society at the moment seems to be constantly celebrating, but this is only a veneer. So we're constantly lost in either alcohol or drugs or some spectacle. But if you scratch that veneer underneath, there is a lot of disenchantment, despair, alienation, sadness, and a lack of belief in the self as well as the collective, and even the universe as, as a concept is you know, people today inside they're really nihilistic. Uh, they have lost belief. And that impedes us from truly celebrating ourselves and uh, one another because we are constantly turned outwards. With uh, Our media emphasizes that, our culture emphasizes that. Consumerism uh, turning into out, out, outside external stimuli to celebrate and not turning within and finding like, the cause of celebration that there is in humanity, uh, creativity, intuition, these are completely forgotten. We're lost in these narratives where, of despair, where, where this, either this virus that should disappear from the planet, or these disempowered little things that you, know, you can't do anything, you're too weak uh, to oppose uh, the powers like, that be in the universe. And that is definitely not true. Uh, if in Greece, where I come from, we have a, like a myth that is really important to us, the myth of Prometheus, the titan that stole fire from the gods and gave it to, to humanity and was punished for this. Uh, so this, this kind of fire is in all of us. This, our, our creative powers is like what has brought humanity to the stars, basically. And if we emphasize this, then we can truly change the our world like, and, and celebrate again, if we first celebrate this. This is for me uh, the yeah. true I mean, thing to celebrate. I that. I'm all about celebration. And what I sort of love is that intersection between where you can take these old uh, sort of things like rituals and origin stories and actually use new technology to actually spread them further. And that's something you're very good at, sort of using content mm. rather than as a distraction mm. as a sort of tool. Yeah, I mean, I think to move in this pro into a new era of positivity or protopia, whatever you want to call it, I think we need to adopt a citizen science approach to things. And what I'm seeing more and more, and what I'll talk about at Breaking Convention, is this idea of combining activities and actually having all sorts of different techniques and then seeing how they combine. So using like, you know, some human technologies like dance and singing in combination with a psychedelic, in combination with a VR experience, in combination with a Lucia light experience and actually creating protocols for, for consciousness augmentation. So you're kind of creating a recipe book and it, it, it's a whole new science, you know? There's so many different ways of augmenting our perception of ourselves and nature. And I think the more we, we, we encourage people to create context instead of content, you know, change the way you perceive as the new content, for me, that's the, that's the new world. Yeah, I agree, and I mean, who here sort of feels like, um, the sort of they are, who feels they are one with nature and who feels that there is this sort of divide? And, and so if there's a hands up, who feels that they are sort of intuitively part of nature? Yeah, see, that's really good. And I bet if you, if you asked sort of most people that, they wouldn't. You know, there is, there is this, this, I love the, the talk earlier about how, you know, nature is just all around us, even in this building, this sort of natural entropy that's occurring. 
So the values are there. I just like to say on that, I think that's a great focus of the celebration. That's kind of the point I was trying to articulate earlier, which mm. I couldn't, which is if, you know, here maybe a large proportion of us feel like we are part of nature, there is just this, this oneness that awakens, and we've still got so many parts of us that aren't awakened to that yet, well then we've got another, you know, five billion moments of celebration as those parts of ourselves awaken to this unity. And that's a really positive focus for me on how we should um, recontextualize our current situation rather than being like, oh, you know, it's all, it's all going to shit, we're, we're yeah. killing ourselves and the planet. It's like, well actually, maybe not. Maybe there's this, this chance that right now we catch in the nick of time and we wake up before, you know, the fire yeah. burns the bedroom type thing. And it has to be a celebration. And if it's not a celebration, you've already given up and you've already lost because I think a lot of the, um, the wisdom that comes out of these plants is about uh, that connection with all things and with all people. And, you know, if you're upset, well, then there's a part of me that's upset. And the more we realize that, the more, um, Profound, the kind of we, we need global technologies. So we need yeah, can I jump in? As well? I think a lot of the kind of indigenous traditions as well, like you know, kind of classic shamanism, uh, there is a lot of celebration inherently in it, like celebrating uh, everything, existence, and all the kind of other species. It's just kind of in giving thanks, you know, in prayer, in, in kind of making offerings. Uh, in uh, acknowledging reciprocity and, and celebrating that and, and having, you know, calendars ordered around the seasons and so on and situ certain ritual practices, it's inherently celebratory and it, it's about giving thanks, which is, you know, one of the most important things you do when, when you pray within a, a shamanic context. It's like, thank you very much, I'm alive, let's celebrate that. <laughs> and I think that's hugely important. And then setting up this dynamic of reciprocity, of, of deeper connection, of like, you, we shouldn't just be extracting things from nature without, without kind of, you know, acknowledging the source of where they come from. And without that source, we're, we're all doomed, you know. And as, I think that's a lot of the part of the problem of where we are currently in the 21st century in the, in the kind of developed world is that lack of reciprocity and acknowledgement of the other, of, of, of well, as ourselves as the other, as ourselves being part of nature. Um, but yeah, celebration is, is vital in that for sure. Um, May I cut in mm -hmm. a bit to add something to, to what David just said? So I come from a culture where the ancient rites of celebration were often orgiastic and they involved a deeply transgressive element uh, the people who were invoking uh, the gods at the time, celebrating the different seasons, they had a deep uh, reverence and all the destructive element in nature and themselves, as well as the bright element. Uh, today, our celebrations, or what the dominant paradigm wants us to see as celebrations, are not really transgressive in any way. They are marketed as such. That the more like crazy you go, the more alcohol you consume, or more drugs you consume, the more you celebrate and the more transgressive you become. But when you live in such in a society that is uh, apocalyptic at the moment and condemned, like almost to to Paris very soon if we don't do something really quickly, maybe the most transgressive thing that we can do in this context is consciously deny that and say, I'm not gonna dance and laugh to the tune of my puppeteers while everything is going up in flames. I'm gonna rage against you. This is another thing that these ancient rites had very consciously, this element of rage. Today, what I find often very disturbing is that there are two, these two extreme narratives, the, the apocalyptic narrative on the one side and on the other, this love and light, let's all tune out. It, this doesn't really concern us because it's really a virtual reality simulation anyway, and you, you can just find the stillness in yourself and avoid the pain, and it's all going to be okay. Um, and the avoidance of anything that has to do with the so called dark and shadow, so rage as well. Uh, but rage is something that we have to, to embrace at the moment, I believe, if we want to, to get out of our current situation. We have to be angry. They don't want us to be angry. They, they want us to be numb. They want our celebrations to be declawed and benign. So I think we should 
change that. I agree, I'm Irish, and there's this Irish idea that you celebrate not despite the dark, but because of the darkness, and it is that, that sort of fire. And I'm quite interested in sort of psychedelics and this, this way of reconnecting. Obviously, if you, if you take them in a, in a more sort of traditional setting, there's a lot of ritual around that. You've been taking them sort of in, in or you know, you're, the study, the studies are in, um, in a clinical situation. Do you find that you're creating new rituals around the taking of these substances? Do you see what I mean? With, because with, for me, there's the whole other half, which is the ritual of it and the celebration of it. How do you transfer that into a modern society or a clinic even? Um, okay, I'll just go quickly. Yeah, like, so obviously, um, a lot of the research, psychedelic research has been going on so far has been with psilocybin. Uh, obviously, like, component of magic mushrooms, I'm sure everyone here knows that. But, um, so yeah, it's quite interesting. Um, psilocybin, unlike ayahuasca, which kind of, when that came out of the Amazon, it seemed to come with its traditional context. Uh, I think it has become distorted over the years anyway, particularly with Western colonization of the Amazon, but it came with its sort of shamanic context, and mushrooms didn't. They, they, they came out of the Amazon via the McKenna brothers and then sort of spread from there, and they've been completely divorced of their traditional context, and they're kind of perceived as a more of a recreational thing than, than ayahuasca, and certainly they're more user-friendly in certain ways. Um, but there is a sort of like interesting traditional usage going back many centuries in, in central Mexico, and they do have their own individual approach, but it's like the guy, the sort of researchers back in the 50s and 60s, they, they kind of independently from scratch figured out the whole set and setting thing, which is obviously a very important part of all these traditional um, indigenous groups who use psychedelics, they, they, own, they have specific rules and a context of a structured use. And we've sort of like, I, we, I don't think we particularly acknowledged the traditional usage of that. And we kind of made a, quite a few mistakes, like, you know, back in the day, people would be given sort of LSD in a very clinical hospital environment. You'd have someone sort of standing over you with a, quick, a clipboard giving you a very powerful psychedelic saying, I'm going to give you this. It's going to probably make you go mad for a while. So it's like not exactly an ideal sort of setting. But we've kind of learned that that's not the way to do things. And um, we have obviously like, you have shamans who are kind of over, overseeing ayahuasca and uh, iboga and psilocybin experiences. And obviously we have a therapist now, or we have usually two therapists. We have a male and a female therapist. And so, and yeah, we use music as the other, probably sub-therapist uh, component. So I think, yeah, we have created our own um, sort of, yeah, to do, like, our own context of usage. And the evidence that we're gathering from that shows it really does work. It's, it's not the same as it was, it's, it's a change, but it seems to be doing the job. Can I chip in there before David does? So I've been involved in the DMT study at Imperial, and um, one of the most amazing things was actually the impact of the technology, we're talking about new rituals, the impact of the technology, the, the MRI scan, the fMRI, um, whilst being injected with NNDMT, is absolutely the most powerful uh, experience I've ever had. And I think the, the moist media aspect of that, so moist media is where you combine dryware with wetware. So the technology being, you know, the, the dryware. So the combination meant that I was met by so many entities um, completely concerned for my health. And I think what, 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 is that what DMT actually is, is, is it's, it's supposition, but released at death. So what you're actually encountering are your spirit guides who think that you're dying and that you're coming, you know, that you're coming through. So, so I know David's had a lot of experience with NNDMT, um, but my point is, is that the benevolence of these entities was probably mostly available because I was in the scanner. And, um, and, you know, there were so many different types of entities all rushing to the scene going, you're dying, aren't you? Look at you. What are you doing in that machine? Can we do anything to help? And I spent the entire 45 minutes trying to calm them down. <laughs> that's, uh, that's kind of like other world setting, isn't it? You yeah. know, you're kind of, brilliant job there, Carl. Um, <clears throat> 
Yeah, you've kind of totally derailed me. And that's really, I mean, I think that we have picked up, like, as Sam said, originally, you know, there was these awful experiments where they looked at psychedelics as psychomimetics, you know, that they could they could mimic psychosis. And sure enough, they did. If, you know, you, you handcuff somebody to a bed and lock them in a room by themselves, giving them their first acid trip with no preparation, which they did, you know, as research, you know, that was science. And then, of course, Leary came along and said, hey, look, if you put people in a nice, cosy room with nice lighting and nice music and nice people, they tend to have a really good experience. Uh, so there was a lot of attention paid to set and setting, which is, is kind of vital. And, and the ritual kind of shamanic context has all those elements of set and setting. Um, and, but I don't think we've, we've kind of fully crossed over the divide into a, into a kind of shamanic context. There is a lot of attention to set and setting, which is vital to a good outcome. Uh, but that people, like you, so you know, in a medical context, you go to a doctor, they poke you around, and then they tell you, okay, you need to take these drugs. You go and see a shaman, the shaman takes the drugs, and then he tells you what's wrong with you, okay? So it's like, it's, it's a very different context. You know, as far as I'm aware, you know, Chris Timberman running the DMT brain imaging study wasn't on DMT himself at the time. <laughs> so that, <laughs> that's where the difference lies in the, in the clin they may have been, uh, clinical context and, and the shamanic context. You know, these people uh, go in there uh, and, and they're kind of like holding the space on your behalf in that same altered state as you are and communicating with the, the spirits of nature and so on. You know, psychiatrists uh, and clinical context, we haven't quite kind of crossed over that divide, obviously, because it's, it's still very much rooted in this kind of secular, uh, non-spiritual approach, and sure enough, it, 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 it works, you know, people have massive reductions in depression, all the rest of it, and what they're finding, the key to that is the mystical experience in a lot of ways, you know, people who have a mystical experience in those settings are the ones who have the best clinical outcomes, so it's not like they've, they've kind of thrown the baby out of the bathwater, they pay a lot of attention to the spiritual experience, they're just not necessarily going to get their, you know, roll up their sleeves and get their hands dirty, as clinicians, but you know, talking to somebody who just recently did a clinical drug trial for depression, they said it was you know, full of kind of spiritual iconography. They had a big Buddha in there, you know, and all the kind of the classic trippy scenes. They had Shipibo wall hangings and everything. So it's kind of all the kind of the uh, the window dressing of a shamanic experience without the shaman, essentially. I, mean, I love that. I love this idea that, you know, beyond just the narratives, we really need to start developing our, you know, our rituals, our modern ceremonies. We've just forgotten all that. Even things like sort of dancing together, we've really sort of lost all these things that create collective consciousness. Someone earlier talked about how it went from looking outside ourselves to in the 60s becoming to sort of meditation, looking inside ourselves, and now we sort of have to step up and, and look collectively together, find that new viewpoint. Um, I'm conscious that you've all been here today and no one got to give their ideas and opinions. Um, so I'd like to throw it out to you guys, uh, because we are, you know, building collective narratives is a collective thing. So you have all these people here to throw questions at, um, but also we're interested in your ideas. You know, how can we carry these narratives today into ritual, into ceremony, into celebration, um, and start to amplify the voices? So there's, is there a roving mic? I don't know. You can steal one of these. One doesn't work. Okay. Yeah. So who wants to start? It's only a very quick statement, really, but I would, I would tell people to get out into nature. I think there needs to be way more of that. We've talked about all these other... The simplest thing of all is to get out. The, I mean, the wildlife reserves, they're all over. Within about four miles of something to do with most people in England, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of SSRI sites sites of special scientific interest, but they're little nature reserves, and they are all over the place, hundreds of them in the UK, and lots of people there that will give advice and show what's happening. There's lots of guided walks, and I, I do really think there needs to be a fabulous amount of encouragement to get people to connect. And, and luckily nowadays, when I, you know, I've, I've always loved it, I've grown up with it, it's part of me, but it was always considered rather weird and geeky, but luckily enough, I was strong enough in my own self not to give a shit about what people thought and <laughs> carried on doing it forever. <laughs> Love my birds from the age of four, and I still do. And, and I just, but now people are so much more connected now and ready to listen. When I first used to pipe on about pesticides, what was happening, what, 10 years ago with our bees, and people used to think then I, I was eccentric and crazy. No, I knew that I was ahead of my time with what was going to be happening. But more and more now, people, I just try and encourage people, your young people, get them out into nature. 
Birmingham, there's lots of woodland around, beautiful woodlands. Get them out there. Make sure you've got somebody with you that can identify the birdsong, the plants, the trees. Make it, you know, the narrative that exists there. That's me. <laughs> Thank you. Could be, uh, so like... So SSSIs instead of SSRIs, I think, you know, it's like, just get out of nature, and then nature adds medicine. No, no, you actually had it right, I was going to like SSRI, sites of special scientific interest, not selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, you know, like you want nature as an expression. I think that's a perfect example of where actually technology can help you find these places as well. You know, use technology, use technology to go outside. Um, totally, totally agree. Because actually, Sammy was saying earlier, you know, the more connected you feel to nature, not only the happier you are yourself, but actually the more you are sort of eco-positive towards, it was in your talk, wasn't it, saying, and I think that's a huge takeaway. The more, you know, everyone's like, what can I do to save the environment? We'll encourage people to reconnect with nature. You know, that's just step one. Okay, well, yes. Hey, so this is a question kind of for everyone. Um, imagine our civilization runs its course, whatever happens, and looking, say, 2,000 years in the future, um, say there is, there are people around, there are people um, either rebuilding some kind of civilization or just kind of continuing on with um, what we uh, started. I'm curious, what kind of stories do you think they're going to be telling hmm. about our age? Wow. That's good. Who wants to go first? <laughs> well, I'll start with that one. Um, well, the fact that there would have been some people still alive, I think the story has got to be pretty positive. Um, and I really, I'm going to be quite, you mentioned something about being radically hopeful. Uh, yes. I'm going to be radically hopeful and say <laughs> that it's uh, a story of uh, rebirth and this coming home of all seven billion of us to that unity. and. Um, I've had the experience to be in like where, what I consider relatively to other experiences in my life, like great harmony with the people around me. And then it's like you don't have to speak. You don't have to speak to people what you want. It's almost just like, oh, I'm looking for a screwdriver, and you know, uh, Sam will hand me a screwdriver because we're on we're in such harmony within the field. And I'm very hopeful that that's what we're in the process of birthing. Uh, a harmony within our broader society which fixes the problems of disconnection. Um, and I feel it would be, really, yeah, be a positive story. This is how we, we, turned it, we, we turned it around. This is how we reconnected to uh, the greater parts of our whole. I mean, I like that. I don't know if anyone has heard the term, is it Eremocene, which is uh, Wilson talking about the loneliness we'll encounter when everything else has has disappeared. Mm. Let's not have that. Yes, no, no, uh, Just only that, what the stories do we tell about as now in the future really depends on what we do now and how that story evolves. So it's like down to us to kind of ensure that that is a positive story, really. Yeah. What we can say. Yeah, no, I think we'll look back with uh, great disdain and contempt at our greed, our laziness, our disregard for other life forms, other beings the way we conduct agriculture, our short-term economic gain. Like I think uh, if, we do, if we do make it to 2,000 years, which right now is, I don't know, it's not looking that, that hot, really. I mean, I, I hope so. I don't, you know, I'm a hopeful person, like greatly so probably sometimes, but the way things Manically are hopeful. playing out and the way that human nature seems to, uh, I'm not convinced our civilization, I don't, the current economic political systems that are in place are not compatible with a long-term ecological civilization and they need, they need tearing the fuck down, really, which is, I know is a radical thing to say and, and mean, but I don't see any other alternative and I know that's going to freak a lot of people out, but we need a whole new way of going about things, so it's kind of death or glory time, really. Um, yeah, we've got a lot of growing up to do as a species. We're, we're, very, we're very intelligent, but not very wise. And uh, although homo sapiens means wise man, it should have really said smart man, because we're not that wise. We've not earned that name yet, so hopefully we will. Um, probably many of you have noticed how Uh, yeah, 
I was going to say, probably many of you have noticed how every new technology that comes up, Hollywood has put it out there first. First, we have the story of what they plan to do, maybe even 20 years in advance, and then it happens. So in this same manner, the stories that we're telling now, or the stories that we let them tell for us, will define our future, and this is going to be the narrative that is going to be told about us later on. Uh, probably you have also noticed how, at the moment, every new TV series focuses on dystopia, catastrophic scenarios of illnesses that are going to annihilate the planet, technology going massively wrong and having a kind of Atlantis scenario, and you see that dominating popular culture as well, uh, books that are dystopian, fashions, even post-apocalyptic clothing be, being like popular at the moment. Um, and the other thing that I see like being on the rise is crime. So crime fiction, crime series, and then we act as if we are shocked when this, these crimes actually happen. So if we don't, as artists as well, if we don't consciously change that narrative, like as a writer myself, sometimes I'm horrified, uh, by the stories that come out from some of my of the minds of some of my colleagues, it, it, it is impossible for me to understand how somebody can visualize something so horrific and then inspire, put the seed into mind and, and inspire that. So I think we're past the point where such stories are beneficial anymore. There, there has been too much Orwell. Now I think it's time to make Orwell fiction again, if we can. Uh, instead of reality. To do that, I think we have to construct new nar narratives that emphasize other more positive uh, like sides of humanity. Um, I've been watching recently this TV series slash documentary, Chernobyl. That is true dystopia. This is something that has actually happened. But at the same time, it shows you self-sacrifice and dignity and the good in humanity, which is something that we no longer see anymore, and especially in our, in our media, uh, in the news. We hear all the bad stories. We hear about everything that we're doing wrong, uh, about how we only have five years left or something, but we never hear, almost never, about what is being done, uh, what is good. There are many activist groups uh, artistic like groups that, are, that remain underground, they, ne they are never publicized to inspire people, and I think this is very important. If the, the, the viewpoint changes, and we put the spotlight on those people, we're going to find out that it's going to have a, a domino effect as well, just like the destructive uh, stories have. I agree. I'm trying to get commissioned the Disney version of Black Mirror, but Netflix mm -hmm. don't want it. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's good. But so just before you speak, there's an interesting thing about hope in that optimism is seen to be people who, who just think everything's going to be okay, pessimism they think is going to not be okay, but hope is actually an under, real understanding of the situation and the challenges that could go either way, but wanting it to go well. Um, and the interesting factor that it tends to be people who are struggling more um, hope more. And there is this sort of apathy that's stopping us from realising our, our struggle in a way that is stopping hope as well. Mm. Anyway, sorry, I suppose from my perspective I'm really interested in what happens to our storytelling when we can start to put our consciousness in other locations and when we can start to access the umvelts of other creatures and even forests, and, and, and we talked about this earlier, but we're getting close already to hacking the subjective experience, to getting, to getting into, your, into your dreams. Like they've already, I was speaking to Sarah James about this, that you can actually, they found a way to um, extract what you're saying in your dreams, and you can actually record that. So, you know, you've got the ability to hack somebody's thinking because when you have a thought, you actually, your voice box actually creates that, you know, the movement of the muscle of the voice is, is, is always there. So you can actually reverse engineer somebody's thoughts. So we're already in 1984 and I'm, I'm really, obviously it's a massive knife edge, but what happens um, to our stories when, when we're having a shared experience. And we're, we're going to explore this at um, Ars Electronica uh, with the Seeing Eye project, where Mark Farid is going to wear somebody else for a month. So he won't have access to his own eyes or his own hearing. Um, so he's going to basically see how um, how solid the, the, the narrative of the self actually is and, and whether, it, whether he can dissolve it because it takes a month to form habits, which is why he's chosen a month. 
So we're you know, using technology to basically highlight these issues because we've got half a million people in Japan that have already become hikikomori, which is when you just log out of society. And I don't know if you've seen Ready Player One, where people are just sort of completely in the virtual world. So, you know, I'd be very interested to see in 2000 years if we've, we've you know, what kind of consciousness will we have? Thing. Thank you. Yes, so many questions. I love it. Hello. Um, I just want to say that the a main theme that I've been seeing is kind of um, the um, the way that a, a new collective consciousness of awakening is kind of popping up in different sectors, and we're all here combined together from totally different avenues, fighting the good fight in a way. And what I really wanted to kind of mention is what you were saying is how do we celebrate these things, this human connection, and it kind of sounds like. Um, as we get through the different levels of awareness is that we understand that there is a very complex and deep-rooted systemic issue that we're trying to deal with. It's not just climate change, it's not just mental health, it's not just resources, it's not just nutrition or all of these things, it's all of it together. And it sounds like we're finding ourselves more and more often in these rooms of people that are aware of this, but they're not overwhelmed. Because if you look at the size of the problem, if individually, if we looked at this, it looks like Mount Everest. Nobody alone would want to even engage on this, but there's so many things to deal with, and it sounds like we're assembling a beautiful force of this renaissance to try and help mankind to prevent extinction, to kind of harness ourselves and our connections, whether it's through technology, psychedelics, through research, through nutrition, all of this, and it's a very beautiful and humbling place to be, and I kind of wanted just to kind of throw in that what we're trying to do with Mantra Party is to celebrate all of that together. And what I wanted to, to kind of bring in through my, my recent experience working with children um, is I'm finding this, um, it's a struggle of this connection at a very young age. And a lot of topics raised here revolve around technology. And I'm finding that there's a lot of young people having issues with psychosis, with hearing voices, with identity related to technology. As an example, people that are seven years old and they're living a life at home, but they also have an avatar on their PlayStation. They're spending actual money to upgrade these things, to put new jackets on, to be cool, to get these points. And then they're also living online. They're getting early access to like Instagram, whether they're 17 or 13 or younger. And it's living this, this double life, which is causing dissonance. And then systemically, that's adding on problems to parenting. This challenge is when a parent gets asked the question, why don't I have an iPhone like Johnny does? Am I parenting my kids right? Are we spending enough time in nature? Is what my kids want and their needs addressed uh, leading into this technology? And what I'm trying to do is to raise more awareness to that, because it's a multi-layer problem. And even at work now, we're doing some more audits about parenting awareness of the positive and negative effects of technology. Yeah. My question to you guys was, is there a way to kind of find um, a nice way to introduce people to technology? Because now we're born as a generation into a place where we don't know how to build a laptop. Yeah. We don't know how this technology works. And some people have the ability to disconnect and be like, okay, I got my laptop, I'm gonna learn how to code and just move on with it. But some people struggle asking these questions and actually not being able to identify themselves because you're surrounded with technology you just don't understand. And things are always moving forward. There is this disconnect right now, isn't there, between the sort of the different, between technology, between nature, between humans, between digital platforms, between real life, between, you know, stories and narratives. Um, does anyone want to have a suggestion? I'm conscious also of, of time, are you okay for yeah. time thing here? It is. Or to two. Yeah, we'll give it five yeah minutes. I think we'll sort of yeah do sort of five minutes, and then we will shift the discussion over to, to I say to real time. But this is real time. We're in physical world here. This is in real life. Um, yeah. Does anyone have a quick? Yeah, that, that was really interesting with the, with the concept of the family and you know new children coming into this technological realm and going back and relating nature, technology, and ourselves. I mean, we often refer to in language, you know, Mother Earth, and then. Uh, if we're the child of the earth or the children of the earth, then is the technology is technology our child? And how does us treating technology um, 
enable, you know, in a positive light and projecting positive um, implementations of that technology then feed back into how the technology treats our children. Um, I think that's a, that's a really fascinating topic to explore. And the answer to how do you introduce it, I feel like, is the content that the technology is used for. So if you're using it to, um, you know, as augment something that reconnects you to nature, so uh, the lady over here was talking about walking around um, the wildlife reserves. Wonderful. But it's so much, I mean, Terence McKenna had a great quote. He said, you know, the first time I went to uh, the jungle, my impression was that it was green. And then I went with a botanist and it started to come alive. And it's like, well, maybe we don't need, a, you know, each have our personal botanists that guide us around the, uh, the wildlife reserves if there can be some technology that introduce children to learning about not necessarily what the teacher wants to teach them that day, because the teacher has to teach everyone the same thing, but maybe, you know, I'm a four-year-old girl and I wake up one morning and all I'm fascinated about is ladybirds. Like, I feel like our education system now wants to uh, channel that diversity and go, yeah, you learn about the ladybird, here's the technology we have available for you to connect with there people is, who teach that. Well, no, no, there definitely is um, a way, I think, of using which, you know, technology to sort of expand and enhance what we can do. You know, I'm a huge fan of Marshmallow Laser Feast, um, and I think sort of something like In the Eyes of the Animal, or if you've ever got a chance to do one of the experiences, what I love about that is it expands what we can do, um, our relationship to nature, and, and our emotional relationship to nature. It says, what can't we do in real life? Let's inhabit different animals. Let's go into a tree and see what that's like. And actually, I think technology in that sense can be incredibly powerful. Um, and I think, you know, as, as, as parents, as adults, as a generation, we have a responsibility to try and get you know, technology designed in a way that, that has those, uses a tool for that. All right, here's one more question. And then it's okay, because I'll, I'll trap these people in this area and they can come and hang them in person. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I've been listening to all of this and it's been absolutely fascinating. And I'm, I'm doing my own research um, about interconnectivity, but I'm, I'm looking at uh, embodiment and the body, and the body's not really been hugely mentioned here, and you're talking about technology and experiences, and I'm just like, what about our body, which is nature? <laughs> and we've totally, you know, it's like, maybe we don't even need to go outside. I can kind of be curious about my hand and how it moves, and, um, you know, if I think about yoga, I can embody a tree or, um, I can embody the movement of wind. And so it's, it's all already here. And to me, technology actually distracts us. And, but I, I've, been, I've learned so much from what you've said that actually it can have its benefits. But for me, in my angle and what I'm um, studying, I'm like, no, get away from the technology. Let's come back to our bodies, which is the earth. And, and the wisdom that's in there, and it's um, always renewing itself as, um, you know, talking about nutrition. Um, so i just kind of curious how you yeah. see that. Um, I'm really glad you mentioned that, because a speaking slot opened up, and I was going to take it, and I was going to talk about movement and the intelligence of the body. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, yeah, it's on the agenda. Yeah. Um, I was going to add a thing. It's also, I'm, I'm a human scientist. I always started with bodies, and perhaps that's a, a lovely thing uh, before I wrap to end on to remind ourselves that actually we, we have a natural interface between nature and it is us, you know, we are the interface. We are so wonderfully evolved to this world. You know, we go and go to space. I'm like, no, we're not evolved for space. It'll be rubbish, we like being in a tin can. Um, but yeah, there's this, you know, people talk about we're born into the world, but we're not, we're born from the world. You know, we're always a natural part of it. And I think before we sort of have a drink and, and discuss this more, if there's sort of one takeaway that you just a sentence or two to, to tell everyone here from your perspectives, um, on that, what would it be? Yeah, so my, my sort of point is whenever I see uh, a digital intervention, um, I'm always looking for the analog version of it first. You know, can we do this with our bodies already? Um, can the technology maybe create, um, you know, some sort of rehearsal for your actual body doing it? You know, so it's all about the structures that we create, and I think that. It's uh, you know it's a, it's a powerful thing to to use technology 
to rehearse a new reality, and I think that's what we what we need. We can't get rid of technology, so we really just need to reframe it, recontextualize it. Thank you. Anyone else on the panel got a final thought? Um, yeah, a little bit sort of a random tangent. I'm going to go on the insights that, that near death experience. Uh, survivors experience have when they when they come back and it doesn't the same core messages come back and it doesn't matter if people are religious or spiritual prior or you know staunch atheists they they are transformed by those experiences and their prior beliefs or lack of them make very little difference and the consistent many messages that come back uh, from people who uh, go through that experience are the loss of interest in the pursuit of material things and money and power suddenly seem like superficial uh, constructs to sort of prioritize one's life, energy and time for. Uh, people become much more uh, oriented to loved ones and to family and actually all of humanity actually, their locus of, of compassion and love expands dramatically beyond their immediate loved ones which can be a bit disconcerting for them but they're much more about connection and they're much more uh, they feel much more compelled to be attracted to, connected to nature and out in nature and doing something for nature and having a positive, uh, they want to use their time to sort of, yeah, to connect and be connected. And so that's kind of like, yeah, an alternative route for what we're talking about here. So yeah, get out into nature and like make time for the special people and beings in your life basically. Yeah. I think that's it. I think, I think I first heard from you, Carl, the amazing expression, we're all just walking each other home. Let's make sure we get there safely and in good company. Mm. And I think, you know, does anyone else have a, a final word on Yeah, that? I mean, I really appreciate ending on the body point as well. And I have this great hope that technology is actually manifesting as a map for us to realize that we are the true supercomputers that we've always been looking for. Mm. But it's kind of like this gradual map and we, we have to build this ourselves to realize that maybe we've already built it in the past and that this consciousness did create this, you know, this one consciousness that unites everything, created this body in some form, even if we don't remember the exact process. So by building something collectively together with this technology, which I feel is a story that we are still writing and we're kind of at this very moment collectively deciding what type of story we want to write with this new medium is, um, is very exciting and we're going to realize in the process of building that that uh, we've just built what we kind of already are we've created something that is conscious and is a part of what we already are and so i think it's important to build technologies that don't um don't hang on to um what they are and are constantly evolving and are happy to, um, you know, like the tree, lose its leaves in the autumn and become something else, rather than, you know, like some of these charities that become so preoccupied with the problem that they're trying to solve in bureaucracy that actually they then create an incentive not to solve the problem because so many people are going to lose their jobs. It's the and fixed that's structures, isn't it, that, yeah, that always that, get us wrapped up. And that's exactly what we don't want to do with technology, so how can we create... Um, you know, stories with our technology that are happy to dissolve yeah. rather than, you know, claim their space, yeah. like the ownership of land, more of a yeah. kind of guardianship yeah. of the spaces. I agree, I think we need to be sort of, yeah, fluid and, and awake. Any final comments, Yuzu? I just want to say, yeah, thank you for that. And I'd just like to kind of echo what you were saying about getting on the land, which has also been iterated a lot. And just like getting in the land as well, like, you know, getting in bodies of water, sitting around a fire, going to the tops of mountains, just like embracing nature, you know, like being a part of it, like getting fully immersed in it, you know. You haven't really arrived, I don't think, in nature until you've you kind of submerged yourself in the elements, you know, rolled around naked in the dirt or swam in, swam in the river or something like that. And that can be kind of hugely gratifying and, and, a, and a very grand way of, of connecting and, and to add to that, there's one thing as well, we're talking about stories and how stories are really important and just one of the projects we've been doing is, is a pilgrimage and that is getting out of the land and telling the stories of the land back to the land in the places where they belong and where they came from. So the origins of these stories, you know, have locations and these are our kind of like our, our myth stories and our kind of ancient stories of, of, of these lands. <clears throat> which you find in, in indigenous cultures all around the world, but we've pretty much lost that tradition to some extent here. So yeah, getting on the land, telling the stories of the land, back to the land, and getting in it as well. Yeah. 
That'd be my message. Thank you. And finally, just before we, we do wrap, um, Lean has a poem that she wrote. In fact, yeah. it's beautiful. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I recently you. had the luck uh, of meeting somebody who, throughout his life, has been a champion of the best in humanity and also a staunch critic of what is destructive in us and uh, always advocating for positive change. You might know that person, it is Alan Moore. I was uh, interviewing him recently for a podcast that I'm developing. He has written this poem uh, that I brought to read to you. Uh, it is inspired by the myth, the Greek myth of Prometheus that I mentioned before. Um, while I read out the name Promethea, I want you to try and replace it in your mind with humanity. I am Promethea and take my name from he bound to a rock and plucked by birds. In me burns his celestial stolen flame. I am the words made flesh, the flesh made words. I am Promethea, my father dead, martyred, his bones torn dread with heresy by those who would turn gold back into lead and sour the world with their sour alchemy. I am Promethea, God adopted one, reared in immaterial hills and veils. My tale is in the world of substance span, yet is my substance in the world of tales. The child who stands between fixed earth and this substantial air, I am Promethea. From my pure light, I stoop into earth's gloom, from fable day descending into facts called weighty night. I am Promethea, the rumored one, the mythic bow that reason stays to bend. I am that voice left. Once the book is done, I am the dream that waking does not end. So I think it is obvious to everyone here that this poem is about the innate gift that humanity is born with and is the best thing that, that we can offer to the next generations and to each other. It's like our creativity, our imagination. Uh, without this, there is no humanity because think about it, there is no compassion without imagination. There is no empathy. Without it, there is no progress, there is no invention. Basically, there is nothing. Without these two things that are the least emphasized by the current paradigm, that is really literally for me waging a, a war on, on dreaming and negates these things as like charities, not needed anymore. We had uh, Yuval Noah Harari, the historian and cultural theorist. He was mentioning how there is all this emphasis in reason there is only this emphasis in technology and science, not for progress, but because what they want to create is humans that have these traits, because they want good soldiers, they want good obedient poems for their own ends, but what they don't really want is a humanity that is sensitive, that is creative, that is empathetic. These elements are completely disregarded. So I think if we gather these elements and say, I am these, then this is, you start the change from yourself and you change your, the world around you. So this is my, the final from me. Thank you. And I think on that, that's given us some great power.